get a glass of water in case I in case I need it. Okay, I'm, sure. Yeah, no problem. I actually just started the the start of the live. So go ahead and get a glass of water though, for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good good timing, everybody. Um uh, he realized at the last minute that he's going to get a glass of water. In fact, I should have done the same thing. So hopefully uh, my voice won't give out. So don't be surprised if I do. Run Normally I get ready with a glass of water, but I didn't uh, didn't today. So hey, everyone, welcome to Open Space. And you can see that uh, there's an empty chair there, which is my guest, uh, Lord Martin Rees, uh, the Astronomer Royal from... Uh, the UK, and we will be having a wide-ranging conversation today about all things astrophysical, from uh, the the earliest ages of the universe through there we go <laughs> through the uh, exploration of space and the existential uh, fate of of humanity. Well. Uh, uh, Lord Martin Reese, thank you so much for joining me here on uh, on YouTube of all places. Great pleasure. Um, I, it, it's really hard, and I, I know I'm sure you get this a lot with all of the titles that that could could be you could be addressed with, Doctor, you know, Lord, Sir. It goes on. Um, for people who don't know who you are, um, who are you, and, and what do you do? Right. Well, uh, ignore all titles. I'm just uh, Martin. Martin, Pinsley. sure. Um, but um, um, my job is as a professor at Cambridge University. I spent most of my life doing um, astronomy and uh, cosmology there. Um, but in my uh, later years, I've done a few other things. I became uh, head of one of the colleges at Cambridge, and um, I became president of the Royal Society, which is uh, our Academy of Sciences. And so that got me involved in... Um, science policy, et cetera. And I've also, over the years, been interested in um, science policy and the long-term threat from technology. And I've written a couple of books, my most recent one called On the Future, about uh, new technologies and uh, how we will cope this century and beyond with these new technologies. Uh, and before we get in, into that, which is absolutely one of my favorite topics, and, and I love to sort of freak myself out about the future. Um, I would love to talk about about your astronomy. Uh, you, you know, I know you've, I mean, you're one of the people who thought about, you were there as quasars. People started to wrap their minds around what a quasar is. Um, but you also uh, have done a lot of work in just this time period of the cosmic dark ages. So for people who aren't aware of this point in the universe, what is it? Yes. Well, uh, before that, let me say, I was very lucky that I started in the mid 1960s. And my advice to any young people who are watching this show would be pick a subject for research where new things are happening, because then the experience of the old guys is a heavy discount. <laughs> they could do this thing, but you have the chance to do the first simple things in a new field. And uh, at uh, the time when I was a student, the first quasar were discovered, first evidence of black holes, and the first evidence uh, that the universe started with the Big Bang. Um, I was at Cambridge University where Fred Hoyle was the great high priest of the steady state theory, yeah. uh, which was a tenable view. And uh, in 1965, um, Penjus Wilson famously discovered that the universe was full of weak microwaves, which didn't come from any obvious source, and that was quickly interpreted as being the afterglow of creation, a relic of the hot, dense early phases. And so we learned in 1965, for the first time convincingly, I would say, that the universe started with the Big Bang. And that allowed people to start thinking about how the universe got the way it is now from some initial yeah. hot, dense state. And uh, we now know that that happened 13.8 yeah. billion years ago. And so uh, the main aim since then and this is leading up to the Dark Ages, is yeah. to um, understand uh, what happened. To start off with, everything was very hot and dense. It expanded and cooled down. And uh, to start with, indeed, for the first 300,000 years, it was like being inside a star, very hot, very opaque. But when uh, uh, the universe was about 300,000 years old, the gas that was making it up, cooled down enough and uh, uh, um, became neutral. The electrons recombined to make hydrogen atoms. And that 
made it transparent. There were no electrons to scatter, free to scatter off. And so then the universe became transparent and the, uh, uh, the, the hot radiation um, thereafter propagated freely. Uh, some of it was detected by Penzer's Wilson in 1965 and so the fills all of space. Um, but the question is, um, what's the origin of stars and galaxies? And we now know that in the early universe, things weren't completely smooth. There were some regions a bit denser than average, some a bit less dense than average. And as the universe expanded, the density contrast grew. The overdense regions lagged behind more and more and eventually stopped expanding, condensed out to make the first structures. And we believe this happened when the universe was about um, probably 15 million years old. It's not very well pinned down, um, but certainly uh, after the universe become transparent. So uh, we have this hot, dense early phase. Then after about 300,000 years, the universe becomes transparent and all the primordial heat shifted into infrared, so the universe becomes literally dark, a dark age. And it stays dark until the first objects form to uh, light it up again, the first stars and the first galaxies. And so the key question is, when and how did that happen? Right. And, uh, and we think it happened, uh, say, when the universe was uh, about, say, 50 million years old. And I mean, this is a classic tricky problem in astronomy. I mean, you've got that the cosmic microwave background radiation that's giving off that that initial light, like the like mm -hmm. the surface of a star of like a red dwarf yeah, yeah. star back at the beginning of the universe. And then you've got this time period before those first stars ignited and you get them coming together as galaxies. So for some for for but and yet all the matter in the entire universe was there we yep. just it just wasn't giving off illumination in the in the same way so what are the what are the techniques that astronomers can use to be able to probe this time period um well of course um uh, when we want to probe that time period we've got to look a long way away and uh, uh we we know that the most distant objects we can see now with our biggest telescopes uh they have a, what's called a range of about 10 uh, which means that uh, uh, the wavelengths are stretched by about 10 uh, right. between the emission and reception. And uh, when we look to the range of 10 and the most distant galaxies we can see have that sort of redshift, uh, we're looking back to when the universe had maybe about 5% of its present age, maybe um, half a billion or years or old or a bit more. Um, now, we already... Uh, see galaxies then so galaxies of some kind had formed and we'd like to go further back but of course the problems are that the uh, objects are still further away still fainter and they are going to be emitting light which we see in the infrared where it's hard to see um, etc and of course we may be looking back to a time before they form because um, it takes a certain amount of time um, at the end of a dark age for um, gas to clump under gravity um, and uh, uh, is that, uh, is that can we pause? What's that? Yeah. Well, we can't, well, we're live, so uh, so. Um, but if you need to grab oh, okay. that, that's yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, mm, yeah. Uh, mm. But the, I mean, just I know that there is like there's a whole bunch of new instruments and experiments coming out which are going to specifically be looking at this time period because, as you say, it's like this. It's this most important phase when everything made that those first, right. you know, the gravity started to come together and bring everything together. And yet it is so difficult to be able to see. But there are some wavelengths like in the radio spectrum, some of these, you know, things like the um, the square kilometer array and, and yeah. things like that that will be able to give you these these hints into that region. Yes. Yeah, well, that, that's right, because uh, uh, we think that uh, the first things to form are are really smaller than galaxies. They're clumps of stars weighing about as much as a million suns and that they form um, and they, they provide the first uh, light which heats up and uh, heats, heats up the gas because the ga gas, as I said, is going to be neutral in the dark age and it gets uh, um, ionized again by this. Um, but uh, you mentioned the square kilometer array. Um, that's going to be extremely interesting in probing back even earlier 
maybe even to a time before the first stars formed, because um, before the first stars formed, um, the gas would be mainly neutral, hydrogen and some helium, and uh, hydrogen uh, emits a famous spectral line called a 21 centimeter line in the uh, uh, radio uh, part of the spectrum, uh, which can be detected. It's certainly detected in galaxies, in interstellar medium, etc. And this material um, uh, can be observed by uh, a very powerful radio telescope. You need a lot large area, but if you can detect it, it's wonderful because um, since you're looking for a spectral line, you can do 3D tomography because uh, you can uh, uh, tune your, your telescope to different frequencies. And as you do that, you're observing different distances. So you can imagine right. that, uh, that, uh, we're surrounded by shells of different wavelengths and uh, further away, they're, they're going to be um, more red shifted. And therefore the trend is to be a lie line is going to have its wavelength stretched by more and more. So in principle, uh, if you've got the um, sensitivity in your telescope, you can actually do tomography and map out the uh, precursors of galaxies before they've even formed yeah. by looking for this line. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, so I'd like to go back to something you just mentioned earlier, this idea that you you know, you know were there watching as the Big Bang got got worked out. Fred Hoyle, I think, was the one who came up with the name. Um, yeah. uh, and of course, the, the but quasars are even a more interesting idea, just that, you know, we're at this time now where there's, there are some open mysteries. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? And, and I find as a, as a science communicator, I see like a lot of people have this almost um, uh, uh, like instinctual, like I don't like it approach to this. And yet it really feels like this is what it feels like to be in the middle of a mystery. Like, like if you knew the answer, then it wouldn't be a mystery. So I would love to hear your perspective on, on having experienced a couple of these mysteries go from initial, yeah. that's funny, all the way through to, okay, we know what it is now, um, yeah. to maybe help guide these next generation of people who yeah, yes. maybe feel uncomfortable by mysteries. Yes. Well, of course, there's no reason why we should expect the universe to be simple. <laughs> Yeah. Indeed, made the way we like it, you know, we've just got to take it the way it is. And we've had, as you say, some surprises. Um, but uh, um, the one um, surprise, but a gratifying one, was to find evidence for a Big Bang um, from this radiation. And also, soon after that, to get corroboration, because it was possible um, to calculate um, what nuclear reactions would have happened in the first few minutes of the cosmic expansion when the temperature was billions of degrees and you get nuclear reactions and to predict the proportion of different elements that would emerge as the universe cooled down. And what was very gratifying was that the amount of hydrogen, helium and deuterium, which were predicted, matched very well what was observed. Right. With corroborations, that's the other pillar of the uh, idea. And uh, we've learned since uh, by observing not just the temperature of the background radiation, but how it varies over the sky. It's been done by the WMAP spacecraft and then the, the Planck spacecraft, the European one. Um, we've, we've learned that the fluctuations um, can be measured there. And those fluctuations have just the properties which are needed to create galaxies by the present time and clusters. So if you uh, put into your computer program, the fluctuations we observe um, when the universe was um, uh, 300,000 years old, um, and th then run the computer forward, you end up with the universe roughly like we see around us, with galaxies and clusters, etc. So I think we know we're on the right lines. And I would say that our understanding of the universe back to when it was about a nanosecond old is in outline as good as what we understand about the early history of our Earth. Right, right. So you believe this as much as you believe what a geophysicist tells you about the early right. history of the Earth. Um, and uh, uh, the reason I say uh, back to a nanosecond is because in the first nanosecond, where lots of important things we realize did happen, the conditions and the temperatures are beyond what we can test experimentally. All the particles are moving around with more energy than we can uh, um, 
produce an accelerator. So things are more uncertain then. Yeah. But we do have this outline picture. But if you asked about surprises, and there have been two big surprises. The first is to realize that most of the stuff in the universe is not ordinary atoms at all. It's so-called dark matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know what this is, but uh, we do suspect that it's some kind of particles yeah. made in a Big Bang, uh, which have no electric charge, and therefore they don't collide very much. They swarm around, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they cluster under gravity. And uh, uh, our models work best if there's about five times as much stuff in the form of these dark particles as there is in the ordinary atoms. And this uh, enables us to understand how galaxies form, etc. We don't know uh, what these particles are. Um, they could be um, uh, very massive particles, which we can't create an accelerator, or they could be something more exotic, mm -hmm. we don't know. But we do know uh, that they behave like um, collisionless particles, uh, which are uh, um, like a swarm and not like a gas. Yeah, I mean, you know, they don't lie. I mean, at this point, I think we have like 15 ish separate lines of independent lines of evidence confirming the existence of dark matter, as you said, you know, mm. with large scale surveys. I mean, we even know how to use it like a telescope to be able to, you know, use gravitational lensing to be able to right. image things that are more distant. We it's just, a dominant gravitational force. Yeah. We just don't know what it is yet, but right. give it time. And so I, you know, if it, as you sort of look at the mysteries that are in current astronomy and cosmology and physics and stuff, you know, you're saying that that's your advice. Pick something fascinating and interesting. Which kinds of mysteries right now do you think meet that criteria? If someone's going into a, into the field today, where should they direct themselves? Um, well, I think uh, uh, asking that question, I would say they should work on something quite different, which is exoplanets. Yes. Maybe we can talk about it later, but uh, yeah. uh, but in cosmology, what they should do is um, uh, use these new facilities which can probe further back in, in greater, greater detail. Um, and of course, um, uh, we'd like to know what the dark matter particles are. And there are three ways of trying to find this out. One is to um, uh, um, look, for, uh, look for them directly because um, uh, they may occasionally um, hit an ordinary atom and you can detect the recoil and there are underground experiments trying to do this. Um, uh, secondly, um, they could perhaps um, annihilate each other and give you Give you give you gamma rays and thirdly we might find some particles in accelerators which answer the description of, of, of uh, the dark matter and indeed people hope for that and they're rather disappointed that so-called supermetric particles haven't been found but i think um uh, some people say well isn't it difficult that uh, we haven't found any candidate i would say that the amount of parameter space mm -hmm. where they could exist is far wider to, to make this more explicit, um, the, there's a, the, about 12 powers of 10 between the highest energy that we can achieve in an accelerator and uh, the energy of so called grand unification, which is the energy when you might expect some new physics to come in. And, uh, and so you could have masses of particles anywhere in that range, and we couldn't detect them directly. We can just detect their collective effects. So I think that. Uh, um, it's worth searching for the dark matter, um, but uh, we may not find it, but we may have new theories right. which, uh, which, which predict it. But I think one point I would make is some people say, you know, isn't it worrying that we have all this dark matter? I would say no, because why should everything in the universe shine any more than it does on Earth? Yes. Uh, there's no particular reason why we should expect everything to shine. Um, and so the fact that there's five times as much gravitating stuff which doesn't shine. Yeah, is uh, something important, and it is very well confirmed, as you say, by lots of evidence which uh, we couldn't explain without it. Um, but uh, we shouldn't be too surprised. It's just slightly more complicated than we expected. Um, but then, um, uh, leading on from that, um, there's the other big surprise, which is called dark energy, um, and uh, um, this this is a discovery made about twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, uh, it was found that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Now, this was a surprise because what people expected was that the universe was expanding, and because every galaxy exerts a gravitational pull on every other galaxy, 
the expansion should be slightly slowing up if you follow two galaxies they get further apart but their relative speed would go down that's what people expected but what they found was that the opposite was happening so this implied there was an extra force a repulsive force as it were latent in empty space which was strong enough to overwhelm gravity yeah in the low densities of intergalactic space it's unimportant in the uh, solar system even in the galaxy but in empty space is overwhelmed and uh, this um, is a deep mystery and in my view this is going to be far far harder mm -hmm. to pin down yeah um, it's it's interesting i mean even i mean we're tw as you say 20 years out from from the discovery yeah. of and 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 the analogy that i always like to give is like imagine you threw a ball into the air and normally the ball should return back to your hand but imagine yeah. the ball just accelerated a off yeah. away yeah. into space right yeah. Yeah. and and that but even like what I love about dark energy right now is that even all of the underlying assumptions that have gone into this, each one is being tested very carefully. And so now some of the standard candles that people are using, like type 1A supernova, people are are double checking to go, well, are they standard candles? And and so I think that that every part and back it's almost like you're troubleshooting you know some machine that is broken and you're like taking apart every part of the machine and going did we get this right okay did we get this right and and so that's even i think as you say a, a deeper mystery a more fundamental mystery one that is going to give its secrets up more slowly and teach us even you know just the process of us learning how to do this is going to teach us more about the universe itself as well no, absolutely so, I mean, yeah uh, well as you say we we can actually get some uh, evidence about it we want to know is the this mystery repulsive force in empty space is it the same now as in the past right we could check that if we can monitor the acceleration at different distances so we can check that yeah. but at the moment it looks as though the force is the same at all times and it's in a sense rather like uh, a, 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 an effect that einstein put into his equations yeah uh, you know there's, there's a term he called lambda the greek letter lambda uh, which was a repulsive force he included it in his equations because he was working out his theory before we knew the universe was expanding he thought the universe was static, and he realized that the galaxies would uh, tend to fall together again. There had to be some countervailing force to, to balance them. And that's why he uh, inserted this extra term in his equations. Um, and uh, people lost interest in this when they found the universe was actually expanding. Yeah, and he called it a now, mistake. Course, it has to be brought back in. But of course, it made it more complicated. But the reason I say that um, it'll be uh, uh, very challenging to understand it is that most people say that it does involve understanding the nature of empty space at a very fundamental level. Right. What I mean by this is that um, we, we understand that if, uh, if, if if I chop up this chair, I can chop it in smaller, smaller pieces, but when I get down to atoms, I can't chop it up anymore. Likewise, um, we think that uh, there's a certain graininess in empty space itself, but there are strong reasons for thinking the scale on which that grayness occurs is a billion billion times smaller than an atomic nucleus it's the scale instead of called the planck scale right which which is the object whose uh, quantum fuzziness uh, is equal to its uh, gravitational radius for black holes so, so it, it's a scale uh, which is very very small and very very far from any direct observations and so until we have a theory like superstring theory which can actually unify gravity, space and time, we won't really be able to understand this force. So I think that's going to be a big challenge. Yeah. And uh, whether humans will ever have the brain power to solve it, I don't know. But uh, some people are trying, as well, you know. But and I guess that's the point, right, is that as long as it's a mystery worth sinking a career into, that's the that's the key. Um, and so exoplanets, uh, dark matter, dark energy, still ripe with with in, well, with, a, a with warning. Ideas. A, a warning. I mean, I'm not sure I would advise people to try and solve the dark energy problem, because I mean, string theory has existed for about thirty years, uh, and it it hasn't really sort of uh, um, led to any results that can be compared with any experiments or observations. And so um, I would actually not encourage people to actually bang their heads against that particular wall. It's great that some 
really outstanding people uh, are doing this, but I think there shouldn't be too many, right. uh, because you, um, uh, you, you've got to at least um, uh, multiply the importance of the problem by the probability that you will solve it yeah. and maximize that product. And uh, I think if you do that, that sum, you probably would avoid trying to understand dark energy uh, until we have some more observations or um, a, right. a more developed theory. But um, um, if I could say a word about exoplanets, I think uh, um, this is um, uh, a topic which uh, has, of course, burgeoned in the last 10 or 20 years. And I think um, this really reflects the fact that um, astronomy is two kinds of science. It's a fundamental science when we try to understand the Big Bang and the basic physics, etc. But it's also the grandest environmental science where we try to understand the environment of our Earth, the planetary system, etc., and of the other stars. And um, uh, in uh, um, our solar system, you've got all kinds of complexities, but the physics isn't very exotic. It's not, no more exotic really than we, what's on the Earth and on the Sun. Uh, but of course, it's very exciting that we've learned in the last 10 years, essentially, that most of the stars in the sky are orbited by a retinue of planets, just as the sun is orbited by the familiar planets we all know about. And that we can learn something about these planets uh, by precise observations. This makes the night sky much more interesting. It wasn't a great surprise that stars should have planets because most people think stars form by a collapsing gas cloud. And if that cloud has any sort of spin, then it'll spin faster as it contracts and the protostar will leave around it a dusty disk from which planets can form. And that seems to have happened. But the systems we find have an amazing variety. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course, the planets are mainly found not by directly imaging them, they're too faint, but by seeing their effects on the star they're orbiting. The two effects, one is that uh, um, uh, their gravitational pull will uh, cause the star to wobble a bit because the star and the planet move around to the center of mass, the barycenter, and, uh, and you can measure the small Doppler effect in the stars and moves around. But the other way is that if a planet transits across the face of a star, then it blocks out a bit of a light. And uh, so if you monitor the brightness of a star very carefully, then if a planet goes in front of it, then the light will dim and then go up again. And that allows you to learn two things. First, from the depth of the dip, when the planet runs, you can learn the ratio of the size of the planet, its area to that of the star. And of course, from how often the dips recur, that tells you the length of the planet year. And uh, in this way, by uh, particularly NASA's Kepler spacecraft, we've discovered thousands mm -hmm. of uh, these planetary systems, some very exotic. But of course, what we'd like to do is to actually image uh, some of them. And that's a challenge. But I think within 10 years, this will be done. Um, the James Webb telescope may help a bit, but I think the big step forward will come when the um, uh, telescope called the, the ELT. Mm -hmm, extremely large. The European telescope. And uh, Europeans aren't very imaginative in their name <laughs> of things. It's, ELT stands for Extremely Large Telescope. Yeah. And this is a telescope which has a uh, mirror of diameter 39 meters. It's actually a mosaic of uh, 800 separate pieces of glass. And this will um, have the ability to collect enough light to uh, take the spectrum of some of these planets orbiting stars and uh, learn something about the atmospheres they have. And of course, um, the question everyone asks is, will there be evidence for life on any of them? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we've we've done quite a, a lot of investigation into you know these these ideas of biosignatures and the kinds yeah. of of biosignatures that that might be required and and of course like all sciences it just gets trickier and trickier over time. Right. You know there mm -hmm. seems to be natural processes that can produce literally every biosignature that you can that you can That's think right. of. Um, I would I would love to at least shift gears and talk a bit about your. Um, about your work sort of thinking about the existential threats that that humanity faces um, 
in the in the time that we have remaining, both literally right. and uh, figuratively. Um, yeah. So, uh, when did you know, does thinking about these sort of vast scale of the universe and the kinds of colossal forces, does that just sort of lead automatically to realizing and thinking about our insignificance and and fragility in this universe? Um, I don't think so. As I say, I got involved with these things through uh, campaigning against nuclear weapons when I was a student and getting involved in, in that sort of issue and policies, etc. But I think um, if you ask, does being an astronomer give any special perspective on these issues, I would answer yes, it does. And the difference it does is it gives you an awareness of the far future. Let me expand on this for a minute. Uh, uh, most people, uh, if they're um, not from uh, Kentucky or parts of the Muslim world, are aware that we are the outcome of uh, four billion years of uh, Darwin evolution. But even people who are happy with that tend to think that we humans are the culmination, we're the top of the tree. No astronomer could believe that because astronomers know that um, the sun is less than halfway through its life. It's been around for four and a half billion years. It'll be another five or six billion before it flares up and dies in the inner planets. And even after that, the universe will go on expanding, perhaps forever, I like to quote. Woody Allen's statement, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. And, uh, uh, and so uh, um, to an astronomer, um, humans may not even be the halfway stage in the emergence of complexity. And indeed, one of the things I discuss in my book is scenarios for the far future, because uh, um, uh, here on Earth and far beyond, evolution will continue. It'll be not uh, Darwinian, but uh, um, it, but designed evolution by a technological species, but any creature which witnesses the demise of the sun in six billion years won't be human. It'll be as different from us as we are from slime mold or a bug. It'll be quite different. Um, and so um, that's a long way of answering your question and saying why astronomers have a special perspective. And this means that um, uh, if some disaster befell the earth, which set back civilization or even destroyed our species, then to an astronomer, this would not only be sad for us humans, but it would foreclose all the possible future developments that might be far more marvelous than what's happened up till now. So the stakes would be higher mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you really felt that a disaster on earth would foreclose a billion year future. Yeah, I mean, when you imagine the kinds of of threats that we face up until the new, the age of nuclear weapons, the threats yeah. were at a local level, at a country level. Um, but suddenly along comes a threat that is that is potential to cause the, the collapse of civilization, if not mm -hmm. humanity. But those, you know, even an all scale nuclear war looks adorable compared to um, th threats of, say, b you know, biological threats, artificial intelligence threats, things like that, which have the potential to to wipe out all life on, on Earth. And then even, you know, other more exotic th things that could wipe out like chunks of the universe itself. So um, it feels um, you know, when I think about, I mean, you know, we think about like say biological issues and, 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 and let's look at say artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are moving, you know, a long time ago, the capability of being able to produce very advanced technology was required in an entire country. And then it required a university and then it required a small team working very carefully. And, and we will reach a point where script kiddies will be releasing artificial intelligence worms onto the internet that they've hacked together from code that they barely understand. So are these kinds of things inevitable, do you think? Well, I mean, I, I worry more about bio mm -hmm. because, you know, same know thing, what, right? Yes. yes. And, and of course, uh, uh, we know what um, <laughs> pandemic can do now. Um, and of course, um, uh, difference between um, uh, now and the past is that it spreads globally and uh, uh, no continent is isolated because um, uh, we are all interconnected. And so 
um, any disaster of this kind goes global very quickly. And of course, um, um, uh, civilization is global, supply chains are global, mm -hmm. and uh, the internet is global. And so uh, uh, a, a virus can spread in a few days. And of course, panic and rumor can spread at the speed of light via the internet. So right. we are all connected. So you can't have a collapse in one continent without it affecting the world. Um, and um, uh, uh, so, I mean, um, pandemics are recurrent. Let's hope we will learn right. so more easily make the make uh, make vaccines for the new ones. We don't know, but of course, the downside is that um, it is going to become possible to engineer these viruses right. already. As in my book, um, it's proved possible to synthesize the smallpox virus and possible to uh, tinker with the influenza. Um, virus to make it more virulent, more transmissible. And uh, uh, once this becomes possible, then um, we, we have uh, a new risk that these pandemics may not be natural, but could be sort of engineered. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course, you might say, well, no one's going to do this. But uh, as I say, in my oh, book, I wouldn't say that. Little, Global village will have his village idiots and they'll have global range. Well, it's not um, even that. I mean, we, we see plenty of examples, say, in the United States, even here in Canada. And I'm sure you have these examples in the UK where somebody with a gun goes and and is a crazy person and takes out violence on people around them for whatever yes, reason. Yes. We saw the mass yes. shootings in, in New Zealand. And so, you know, mm -hmm. that gives a person the power and then they pull the trigger. And so mm -hmm. as the technology advances, both in the in the artificial intelligence side and on the biological side, the it gets closer and closer. The, the complexity of it gets gets more into the grasp of a regular individual. And yeah. so there's too many vectors to watch every crazy person who is, you know, tinkering away on artificial intelligence in their in their mm -hmm. lab somewhere. Right. We won't know who's going to release the next pandemic or who's going to release mm -hmm. the next you know, and eventually people will be releasing thousands of them. Mm -hmm. So how... Well, I, th I think this, this is scary. And, um, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, the one thing I would predict is it's going to increase the tension between three things we want to preserve. One is um, uh, privacy, the other is security, and the other is freedom. And I think uh, uh, the tension between those, and uh, I think the balance will be drawn differently mm -hmm. different countries. I think uh, uh, in China, they'll abandon privacy in order to have security. Uh, you Americans may go the other way. You'll go for, go for liberty and be prepared to take higher risk, perhaps. And uh, the Europeans somewhere in the middle. But yeah. there's going to be a growing tension uh, simply because um, the uh, downside to just one um, uh, lone weirdo are so much greater mm -hmm. now than in the past. And, and so, I mean... You're seeing, like with the coronavirus, you're seeing people. Um, oh, I said the word. Now YouTube is going to demonetize me. Anyway, um, and so as the with the coronavirus, um, we're seeing this battle play out in in real time as people are being concerned about their privacy and saying, okay, I don't want to install an app on my phone that's going to track my location and allow me to you know, easily be traced if, if I've come across somebody who has had the disease. And yet by giving that app to everybody, we would be able to shut down the spread of this disease very rapidly and be able to shut down future diseases. So I think that that example of privacy goes out the window, right? If, mm. if you want to be effective. So do, do you think that, that these are some of the first things to fall? Um, well, uh, I think so, but I think they'll fall last in your country. Well, I'm Canadian, so yes. so well, don't you're worry. Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't worry about us. Well, you know, whatever the Queen tells yes. us to do, we'll do that too. Y y yes. Okay. Um, uh, but but it is going to be attention, and of course, let's hope that um, uh, the sort of antidotes uh, and uh, um, vaccines will um, be more easily developed in the future as we understand these these viruses better. Uh, likewise. Um, there's going to be a sort of arms race between cyber attackers mm -hmm. and cyber security. Um, and uh, you know, AI helps both sides, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And we're vulnerable to, to that sort of thing. And um, uh, uh, the kind of threat that's worrying is um, uh, uh, a shutdown of the uh, electricity grid. 
mm -hmm. in a large chunk of your country um, because it's not just the lights going out it's everything failing yeah and um, i quote in my book a report from the american department of defense which uh, uh, says that if there were um, a uh, state level attack on the electricity grid of the eastern part of the united states it would i quote merit a nuclear response as bad as a nuclear attack right right that's, that's very scary and and so again you know back to that that idea that if if somebody somewhere anywhere in the world is able to release artificial intelligence that is able to cause havoc then really the only response is a better artificial intelligence that's under the power of good, right? In the power of safety and protection, but then you give up freedom because you're essentially giving over your, you know, your protection to an artificial intelligence. Yes, I mean, I, I say I worry less about artificial intelligence than about um, uh, bio and, and simple simple breakdowns in systems, you know, uh, computer systems going wrong. Um, I think um, uh, uh, you know, advanced AI um, may happen, but um, uh, I think uh, AI with an evil intent is not a realistic. Well, it'd be just, just um, AI I, going wrong. Well, I just, I just think maybe you just haven't freaked yourself out enough about it yet. That's all. Um, yes, you know, when, I mean, just like just the equivalent of, of you know, in your, pre in your presentation, you talked about just how a computer taught itself to play Go yes. very quickly and was able to do this. You know, imagine a computer, you know, under the instruction of a person. Like it doesn't have to be a rogue artificial intelligence. It just has to be a very clever computer program that's yes. been told to dismantle some other country's electrical grid by any means yes. necessary. Yes. Yep. And mm -hmm. and that is a perfectly feasible outcome. Yes, and that's why I said there'd be an arms race between the right. cyber attackers um, and the uh, uh, cybersecurity people, both, as you say, will be making use of the best AI. Yeah. And, and, and when we think of the, like, this is kind of what's going on with evolution, that our bodies have developed an immune response that is dealing with various attackers all the time, parasites, viruses, etc., allergies. Um, and yeah, right. we have, you know, we don't, tell our immune system what to do anymore we just hope that it works right it keeps yes. us ahead of the of the pathogens right mm -hmm. and it, it it feels to me as i sort of chart this forward as the cycles get faster as the attackers and the defenders get faster that after a while we as as simple human beings can't stay on top of it anymore we can't we can't specifically be in charge of it Yes. Well, I mean, I think, you know, if, if we look in the far future, uh, then uh, post-humans will evolve by um, uh, intelligent design and uh, uh, maybe electronic, etc. And they, they will have the uh, um, power of, um, uh, of, of advanced AI. Um, and uh, they, they are the creatures that are going to spread from the Earth into space, in my opinion. Um, but, uh, but, but I think... Um, uh, the, there's a, a mistake that some people make. Um, we evolved through Darwinian evolution, which favored two things. One was intelligence, the other was aggression. But if we think of a, of a machine, um, it's a, it may favor intelligence, but it's no reason why it should be aggressive. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. It's sort of programmed to be such by a human being. Because remember that um, these, these machines, um, uh, their universe is a, a board game or something like that. They don't understand the real world, um, even the ones that seem clever. I mean, I was, I was told to give an example that the, um, uh, the, the computer called Watson that won the game of Jeopardy, the game show, um, it, it, it understood everything in Wikipedia. The member was asked, which is bigger, a shoebox or Mount Everest? Couldn't answer. Right, of course. Because, you know, uh, it's wrong to assume that they actually understand the world and, uh, and have a, a, a conception of, of, of the world and... And, and in the way that we do. Yeah, no, but I mean, anyone who has programmed a computer has seen how 
small mistakes can have the tendency to oh, cause indeed. large yeah, yeah. a large yeah. impact you know and yes, so, so i think it's the, it's the breakdowns that are going to be really catastrophic if we depend too much on them right yeah. and yet we may depend on them to keep us safe from the yeah. people who are creating the ones intentionally to cause more damage right. so right. it's a it's a it's a fascinating time and I, you know, I don't, I think about it a lot and I don't have a solution, but I think when I go back to that idea that you gave or that the, those, those things that you can have, you can have safety, you can have security, you can have, I forget what was the third one, safety, security yeah. and liberty, liberty. Yeah. Yeah. Pick yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pick, pick two. You get to have two. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's terrifying. Um, and yet we are in a moment right now with coronavirus experiencing uh, well, it's a, well, it's similar, isn't it? No, it, it, it absolutely is. That, that you are you're becoming you're being confronted, and we are choosing to give up liberty right now. For example, in yep, yep. right that we're staying at home, that we're not going out, we're not getting into crowds, we're not watching football matches, etc. And that is that's just an example of of what it will, may feel like leading yes. into the future. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like? Um, events like coronavirus will help us face some of the more nebulous threats that we're looking at, like climate change, for example? Um, I, th I think they will, because um, uh, uh, in a sense, the, uh, the response to, um, to, the to the virus is a speeded up version. Yeah. Of what we're going to need in order to deal with climate change. I mean, obviously, uh, the uh, serious downsides of um, uh, climate change are decades away. Um, but on that time scale, we've got to uh, deploy and innovate technology uh, to get um, uh, yeah. fossil free energy generation and all that. And so it's a similar uh, global challenge. And uh, I, I, I just hope people will realize that um, uh, uh, we've got to foster science and innovation um, in order to deal with these threats. Um, clearly, everyone realizes we have to in order to get vaccines and and uh, and drugs. And similarly, uh, we need, in my view, um, uh, clever new ideas um, if we are to move towards a low carbon economy. I think it's going to be very hard to persuade um, politicians to um, uh, prioritize something which is long term, long beyond the next election and also global. Mm -hmm. So it's a it affects people far away and not just their constituents. So that's hard. And so uh, my personal view, and I've written a bit on this recently, is that the um, way we really tackle climate change is by a really intense program of research and development to get uh, more efficient clean energy, better energy storage, and I would say maybe uh, for fourth generation nuclear power, which is safer, etc., cetera, um, and to bring the cost of that down. Yeah. So that uh, countries like India and Africa, where they need more energy, will be able to leapfrog directly mm -hmm. to clean energy and not build coal fired power stations. Because they build coal fired power stations because they're cheaper. But if right. um, these were cheap, uh, then they could leapfrog directly to them, just as they've leapfrogged directly to mobile phones and never had landlines. And so uh, I think that the top priority um, should be um, to um, prioritize. R&D into everything connected with clean energy. Um, just as incidentally, if we're to feed 9 billion people by mid-century, we've got to have more efficient food production. Right, of course. If we're to do this without encroaching on the land that's now natural forest, etc. And so um, uh, better and more intensive food production, artificial meat and all those things, they're also um, areas where we need more science. So I would say to, um, to young scientists and engineers um, that uh, uh, the idealistic challenges are to provide clean energy and enough food for right. the uh, world. And they both involve uh, exciting new science. But I, I think your point of it, of it going at high speed of this being yeah. being climate change in a nutshell is is a, I think is a perfect example because we are seeing some administrations deal with it properly. We are yeah. seeing other administrations completely fumble their response yeah. to the to the coronavirus and and to be honest, it's the closer people are to respecting the science, the better a job they're doing in responding to this challenge. And and 
and I, you know, all of the things that you described are all wonderful and they are definitely important, but <clears throat> in a lot of countries, um, people are even just having fundamental arguments about whether or not this stuff is even important. And yet we are facing, you know, a, it is marching ever onward and, the, and yet our, our fates are intertwined as well. Yes. And, mm. and so I wonder if, if the, you know, the coronavirus doesn't care whether or not you believe in it or not, <laughs> right? And climate change doesn't care whether you believe in it or not. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that um, uh, people are going, going to become aware of what the power of science is and what the need for science is. I mean, after all, uh, um, our world is much better than the world of previous generations because of science. Yeah. And uh, in the life span of people in Africa is twice what it used to be because infectious diseases have been controlled, etc. So there's been a, a plus, but there are these new downsides which are getting larger and looming ever more prominently, and we do have to cope with them. But I think um, people will realize, I hope, that the answer to these problems is um, uh, more science, but also better directed science. But also, uh, the appropriate governance, because we do have to right. uh, deal with the lone weirdos and all that. So I think we're going to have a bumpy ride through this century. But I, I think that um, the way to control it is going to be to ensure that um, uh, um, we do develop the right size. And incidentally, go back to AI, uh, then uh, the, it makes a big difference in which order new things develop. I mean, some people say, well, let's get the AI first, and that can help us with the other problems. Absolutely. I mean, again, you know, if we get it done right, then it can. And if we do it wrong, then, you know, yeah, yeah. then then we've got other issues that we have yes, to face. Yes. Um, yes. But but I sort of as a person who people turn to, I mean, you're someone who people turn to politicians, people, people who are setting policy and trying to figure out the direction that the country is going. Do you find that they are listening like they're asking you for your opinion? But are they, are they listening to your advice? Um, I would say on the whole they are. Um, and of course, uh, we've got to realize that the decisions that politicians have to make um, uh, uh, involve taking the science into account, but they involve other things. I mean, for instance, to take an immediate one in this country, um, uh, should should schools reopen? Mm -hmm. you know, you know, uh, uh, we know there's going to be a trade off between accepting a certain risk and not damaging the... Uh, uh, development and uh, uh, mental welfare of kids from disadvantaged homes. And that's a genuine trade-off. And uh, scientists can't make that balance. That's got to be done by the public and by politicians. But we need the best scientific advice. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I think people realize that we need, need the, the, good, the good science. Yeah. And, um, it, and it, 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 I mean, it, you know, as someone who has been involved in science for, for most of my yeah. life, it, it, like I, I can absolutely understand where science can go in the wrong directions, but at yeah. the same time, it feels like a lot of very good science is just not being listened to. And, right, and at yeah. the end of the day, it's, it's the same process. It's literally just curiosity and asking yourself, how does the universe, how does the world work? And hopefully in a unbiased way. Yes. And this gets back to education. We, um, we, we want, science education, uh, not just for those who are going to become scientists, but for everyone, because lots of the decisions that politicians have to make involve science. And if you want a serious debate in democracy, then people have to understand numbers a bit and not be bamboozled by uh, bad arguments, etc. cetera. Um, and this is true for uh, any arguments about sort of health, energy, environment, etc. cetera. Uh, so we need uh, better science education and of course astronomy is valuable because um, people are ambivalent about some sciences like genetics and nuclear uh, whereas um, for things like um, uh, um, ecology and uh, astronomy they're positive and mm -hmm. that's why they're especially good for kids and of course for kids yeah. um, the most popular subjects are astronomy and dinosaurs <laughs> yeah every, everybody loves yeah that 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 would have been my other path would be uh, you know focusing on dinosaurs if i hadn't focused on yeah, astronomy yeah. so, well, so start, well that's a way to start and of course that, yeah. that gives the light to the view that you've got to make science relevant for kids because nothing's more irrelevant but uh, the mystery and wonder is what grabs them and you've got to lead from that to other things but uh, just just to lead on from uh, just a thought related to ai 
um, if we think of the far future, um, then where we need AI is going to be away from the earth because uh, obviously we can imagine that um, uh, uh, we're going to be um, fabricating large structures in space, um, exploring the solar system and eventually beyond. And uh, this is going to be done by more sophisticated robots and AI. And I think uh, um, it's, it's uh, that way and not by sending humans yes. that we will get the uh, most cost-effective answers and uh, uh, and be able to both exploit space and understand its mysteries. Uh, the, the best description that I heard, and I, I forget where I heard this, was that that AI, ideally AI would be the CEO of of the company and and humanity would be the board of directors that right. that we would set the overall policy for where we want humanity to go. But AI would be out there doing the work to help us yes. get there. Um, yes. But as long as it's always still in service of, of what we want, because yes. and as you said earlier, we've got to make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, have some bug in it. That it uh, goes off the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're just reaching the end of our end of our hour. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, let's just talk a bit about your you you know, what you're working on right now and where people can can find out more. So uh, are, your most recent book? Uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, in fact, um, my most recent book, I'm sorry, I I sort of had a copy to. Oh, wave in I, front I, of you. I usually uh, but, try to remind yeah. people to do that. But yeah, yeah, but it's, it's called um, uh, um, it, it's called uh, on the future prospects for humanity, um, and uh, um, it came out about eighteen months ago, and it's uh, now translated into eighteen languages, and so it's uh, uh, and I think it's accessible, um, and it uh, it talks about these uh, developments and also what it's like to be a scientist and the limits of science. Are the things we never understand, etc. So, I think it's just fairly short and a uh, and a good read. So, I'd recommend that. What I'm doing now is thinking more about the uh, um, the, the the dark age and thinking about some uh, exotic objects in the sky, uh, gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts and things, yep. which are mysteries at the moment. And they're examples where we may learn some new physics because nature performs these experiments and produce extreme conditions that we can't simulate in the lab. So we learn some new physics as well as learning something new about what's out, out there. So I'm doing this, but also I'm spending quite a bit of time on policy questions. Um, and uh, um, in fact, we have a center in Cambridge called the Center for Study of Existential Risks. Absolutely. Uh, which, is try, which is trying to use the convening power of our university to uh, try and uh, uh, deploy the best science to um, uh, understand these threats and uh, minimize them and prepare for them. Yeah, uh, absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Um, I really appreciate your your work in both fields, in both in astronomy and in in existential uh, crises. And uh, I, I really appreciate um, you know making a lot of this very accessible and and uh, you know a serious topic that people should be seriously thinking about as opposed to laughing it off. I think it's great to to have these conversations. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And uh, and and please let me know uh, when we figure out uh, what dark matter is. <laughs> yes, well, it's been great talking with you. Thank you very much right. for having me on the show. All thank right, you. take care. Mm -hmm.